Good evening and welcome to tonight's Open University here on BBC Two. Our programmes for this evening are from the Discovering Physics Second Level Science course, Physics Beyond Experience. To play snooker, I need a knowledge of what happens when billiard balls collide. And this relates directly to Newtonian mechanics. But of course, there's the human factor of skill and judgment as well. But when I'm potting a ball, I'm certainly not consciously applying Newton's laws. Yet my common sense feel for the right angle is in complete accord with Newton's principles. Well, in this program, we're going to explore an area which is far away from classical mechanics, far away from Newton's laws, and where our common sense notions aren't going to be much help to us at all. Well, what area am I referring to? Certainly not phenomena on the scale of the solar system. After all, Newton's laws work extremely well. We can predict precisely eclipses and so on. Nor is it the world of our everyday surroundings. Newton's laws work fine there. No, it's the realm of the atom where our common sense notions let us down completely. Yet physicists did, for a long time, try to extend classical ideas right down to atomic dimensions. And the Bohr atom is an example with miniature billiard balls orbiting around. Well, atomic physics is much more fascinating than miniature billiard balls. We'll need to bring in entirely new ideas far away from our everyday experience. But first, let's try to get things in perspective by looking at the kind of distances and speeds that we measure when we do physics experiments. The distance scale is logarithmic. It ranges from these astronomical distance scales right down to the subnuclear region. Now let's get our bearings. 10 to the 13 metres is a reasonable estimate of the distance across our solar system. And at the other extreme down here, there's 10 to the minus 14 metres, which is roughly, to within an order of magnitude, the distance across a nucleus. Now the speed axis is also logarithmic. It ranges right up here to about the speed of light, about 300 million meters per second. Well, obviously we can put an awful lot of observations on this diagram, but if we're only concerned with our everyday experience, we can concentrate on a much smaller region. Now in the everyday world, we come across distances ranging from say, about 10 to the minus four meters, the distance across a speck of dust, right up to say, the distance you can see to the horizon on a clear day, about 10 to the four meters. Now the speeds we come across will range up to say the speed of a very fast jet aircraft, about a thousand meters per second. So this then is the area of our everyday experience. Now it's quite a small part of the diagram, remember both the scales are logarithmic. But it's a very important part because it's observations and experiments we make here that determine our common sense view of physics. Now our common sense ideas are well described by Newton's laws of motion and other classical laws like that. But as you saw in the relativity unit, these ideas aren't quite right. And they fail completely up here at very high speeds where we observe relativistic effects. Now here we have to use a special theory of relativity, not really a common sense theory, but we have to use this theory to understand phenomena in this region. Now there's another region of the diagram where our common sense lets us down again. It's over here in the subatomic region. Now here we observe quantum effects, which we can only understand if we use quantum mechanics. Now quantum mechanics is not really a common sense theory of nature, but we have to appeal to experiment to see what features this theory will have. Here are some tracks produced by particles like electrons and protons in a device called a bubble chamber. They're certainly suggestive of tiny particles following definite paths as they fly across the chamber. And you can also probably see that they're bent around. That's because the whole chamber is in a magnetic field. And if I measure the curvature, I can use the laws of classical physics to work out the momentum of each particle. In fact, you've used just this idea in a summer school experiment, the magnetic field experiment. This is the apparatus you used. And if I turn on the magnetic field, you can see the electron beam being bent 
just like the particles in the bubble chamber. Well, so far, there's nothing to suggest that the laws of classical physics can't handle all this. But take a look at this apparatus over here. Here's a similar sort of tube with an electron gun, and the electron beam hits the phosphor screen here at that spot. And I can move it around with a magnetic field from this tiny bar magnet. But now suppose I were to put this very small metal foil in that tube just downstream of the electron gun. Now what effect do you think that would have? Well, I can actually do that experiment because over here I have a tube with just such a foil installed in it. So let's dim the studio lights and I'll turn up the voltage on the electron gun. I'll do it just once again. And there you can see this beautiful ring pattern, undeniably a diffraction pattern. But these are being produced by electrons. Yet I can only explain that in terms of a wave phenomenon. In fact, if I measured the position of those rings and I knew the spacing of the atoms, I'd be able to use the diffraction formula to actually work out the wavelength of the electrons. But what does it mean, wavelength of an electron? After all, a moment ago, I was talking about them in terms of particles. And those particle properties haven't gone away. If I were to turn down the intensity of the electron gun, you'd find that individual electrons leave the gun and individual electrons arrive in different parts of the ring pattern. It's just that the intensity is so large that normally the huge number of electrons evenly illuminate the rings. But now our classical physics really is in trouble. It can handle things like particles or behavior like particles. It can handle behavior like waves. But it's in difficulty explaining what happens with electrons behaving like waves and particles. So where do we go from here? Well, maybe we should look at the connection between the momentum and the wavelength of an electron. The electron's wavelength is given by this formula, which was first written down by Louis de Broglie. It says that the electron's wavelength, lambda dB, is equal to h divided by the magnitude p of the electron's momentum. The constant h is, of course, just Planck's constant. It's a constant that crops up in practically every equation in quantum physics, although it never occurs in classical physics. Well, there's an important point to remember about this equation. It applies not only to electrons, it applies to any particle with momentum p. Well, here's a moving billiard ball. It's certainly got momentum. Let me apply de Broglie's formula to it. Maybe it's got an associated wavelength, in which case I should be able to diffract it, just like electrons. And here, in fact, is a diffraction grating, regularly spaced slits about 20 centimeters apart. So let me fire this billiard ball along the center and see what happens. Well, just as you'd expect, I think, they went straight down the middle. Quite different, though, from our electrons. Remember how they diffracted in our earlier experiment with the tube. Well, why didn't I get diffraction effects with billiard balls if they have an equivalent wavelength? Why didn't they arrive on either side of the pocket, giving the usual pattern of maxima and minima? Maybe we should put the numbers into the de Broglie formula. Well, what's the mass of a billiard ball? Say four ounces, about 100 grams. So I have m equals 0.1 kilogram. And if I say the speed is about 10 meters per second, V equals 10 meters per second, then I can work out the momentum, and it comes out to be 1 kilogram meter second minus 1. Now let's use the de Broglie formula, lambda equals h over p, to work out the equivalent wavelength. Well, if I put in the numbers, because h is such a very, very small number, then lambda works out to be 10 to the minus 34 meters. Now that's an incredibly small wavelength. Let's see what the equivalent diffraction angle is. This is the formula I need for diffraction. Lambda equals d sine theta. Remember that d is the slit spacing and theta is the angle of diffraction. Here's the first order diffraction here. 
Well, again, if I put in the numbers, I'll find that theta is about 10 to the minus 33 radians. Well, that's a fantastically small angle. And what that means is that these various orders of diffraction all get squeezed into an infinitesimally small area around the axis. So small that we'd never ever be able to observe them. And the important conclusion is that these everyday effects don't actually contradict the de Broglie formula. It's just that for the everyday world, we don't have to be concerned with wavelengths of objects like billiard balls at all. But we do observe wave-like effects with electrons. As John showed us, they're diffracted. And when we do experiments like this, we find that the wavelength of an electron is given by the de Broglie formula. Well, electron diffraction is a purely quantum effect. We can't explain it using classical physics. So now let's move on to look at another way in which classical physics and quantum physics part company. When billiard balls are set up like this, I know that if a ball comes in from this direction and hits the blue just tucked in behind the yellow, then both of these reds will be pocketed. Well, it wasn't just because I've seen it before. The result's entirely predictable on the basis of classical mechanics. If I came back next week and played the same shot, we'd get exactly the same result. Well, this idea of predictability is really just common sense, and it's completely basic in classical physics. If you do an experiment and get a result, then if you come back later and do the same experiment under the same conditions, you must get the same result. Well, this idea of predictability certainly works when we're playing billiards with ordinary billiard balls. But what if we were to try to play the game with electrons instead? Well, here's my electron billiard table. You probably recognize it as our familiar diffraction tube. So let's pursue our billiards analogy, but sticking strictly to what we can observe with real electrons. At this end, instead of a billiard cue and a diffraction grating, I've got an electron gun and a thin metal foil. And over here, I want you to imagine that I've got a pocket for catching electrons, in reality some kind of electron detector. And as the electrons come along the axis, a lot of them do go into this pocket, but they also end up on these beautiful diffraction rings. Well, now let's concentrate on what's happening in the plane of the table. In fact, imagine that I've got a whole array of pockets spread out on either side of the central pocket then I'll get a lot of electrons being caught in pockets in the bright areas, here and here, and very few or no electrons in these dark areas. What I've got, in fact, is my usual diffraction pattern with peaks and troughs. The central pocket is here, with the other pockets on either side. But now I want to ask a very important question. Suppose we consider one particular electron from the electron gun. Into which of these many pockets will that particular electron go? Well, it seems a simple enough question. It's the kind of question that classical physics answers for us all the time. And I can certainly say that it's got a greater chance of going into a pocket in a bright area, corresponding to a peak in the diffraction pattern, than in a dark area corresponding to a trough. In other words, a bright area means higher probability. And if we think of that in terms of our diffraction pattern, it means that it's not only telling us about the numbers of electrons detected, but it tells us directly the probability of where the electron will go into which pocket. But I still haven't answered my original question. Into which one of these pockets will it actually arrive? Well, it turns out that for objects like electrons, the very best I can say is something in terms of probability. I just cannot predict where an individual electron will arrive. Well, so it seems we're in much the same position as a roulette player. I can't normally predict where the ball's going to end up, but I do know the betting odds that the different numbers will come up. In the same way, when we use quantum mechanics to analyse an experiment, even if we know the possible results, we can't normally predict the outcome of the experiment, or we can predict are the probabilities that these different results will come up. In this way, quantum physics differs fundamentally from classical physics, where we deal normally with certainties, not with probabilities. Well, quantum mechanics is a very remarkable theory because it enables us to incorporate this idea of probabilities, and it also enables us to come to terms with a wave-particle duality. 
But before we can go into any more detail about how quantum mechanics works, we need to look at the properties of waves in general. This is an ordinary sine wave travelling along the positive x-axis. It could really be any type of sine wave, for instance, a pressure wave or a water wave. If we take a snapshot, we can easily see that it has a sharply defined wavelength, lambda. Now, there's another important quantity we can use to describe the wave. It's called the wave number, and it's denoted by the letter k. Now, the wave number is equal to 2 pi divided by lambda. Now, there's no new physics here. This is just a definition, and you'll see why it's useful in a moment. But let's go back to the snapshot and draw below an axis on which we can mark wave number k. Now, the wave number of that wave, that's 2 pi over lambda, is marked here. Now, the height of this line is equal to the amplitude of the wave. Well, now let's consider another wave. Now, this one has a different wavelength, so it has a different wave number. And the amplitude of that wave and the one before are different, so they have different heights here. Now, we can combine these two waves using the principle of superposition. There we are, as the bottom one's being wiped off, the combined wave is appearing along the top. And it's no longer a simple sine wave there. It's very localized, though, in this region here. Now, we can go on to add a third sine wave. This one has a slightly higher wave number, and it has a different amplitude, too. Now, when these waves are added together, we get an even more localized wave. Well, obviously, we can keep on doing this, adding more and more sine waves. And here, many different waves have been added together to form a very localized wave here. It's called a wave packet. Now, to make up this wave packet, we have had to use very carefully chosen wave numbers and amplitudes. And that's a very important point. Now, these ideas are completely general. They apply to any type of sine wave. But what's all this got to do with quantum mechanics? Well, let's try to use these ideas to model the behavior of particles like free electrons. After all, a wave packet does have a sense of lumpiness, like a particle, and evidently it has wave characteristics. Now, what's the significance of this wave number plot down below? Well, wave number is defined as 2 pi over lambda. So let's use the de Broglie formula to change wave number to momentum. If I put in the de Broglie formula, this gives me k equals 2 pi over h times p sub x. The suffix here is because we're measuring momentum in the x direction. But the important thing is because h is constant, this shows that wave number is directly proportional to momentum. So I can relabel this axis as momentum. Now, what about the top graph? Well, it's obviously telling me something about the position of the electron. But I must be very careful how I interpret this. What's the connection between these mathematical waves and a real object which has mass and charge like an electron? Well, remember that the experimental evidence indicated that we should think in terms of probabilities. And what quantum theory does is to make a link between these amplitudes of the wave packet and the probability of finding an electron at that position. So that although the electron is somewhere around here, what I can say is that it's more likely to be at this point, where the amplitude is large, than at this point, where the amplitude is small. And once we've made this imaginative connection, there's a lot more that the model can tell us. For example, suppose I know the momentum of the particle very precisely at some instant. Then as Graham showed a moment ago, that corresponds to an infinitely long wave of fixed wavelength. So I know nothing at all about the position of the particle, uncertainty principle. In words, it says that it's impossible to measure both the position and the momentum simultaneously, that's important, with a precision better than the limit expressed here. Now, it's important to realize that this built-in uncertainty has nothing to do with how well or how clumsily we measure these quantities nor does it re represent a deficiency in quantum theory. It's a fundamental limit imposed by nature itself and which you can't get around. So here's another effect for which we have no parallel in everyday experience or in classical physics. 
In fact, how does the uncertainty principle square up with the everyday world? Well, to have a reasonable chance of potting that brown, I need to know its position, and I want it to stay put while I'm lining up the shot. Well, I think I know its position reasonably well, and it's stationary, which means that its momentum is zero. In fact, isn't delta P zero as well? And in that case, doesn't delta X times delta P equals naught, violating the uncertainty principle? Well, before I rush to such a rash conclusion, let me just check exactly what the uncertainty principle, this formula here, puts, what sort of limits it actually puts on the precision with which we can measure delta P. In fact, suppose I were able to measure the position to something like the wavelength of visible light, delta X of order 10 to the minus 7 meters, roughly. Then if I put in that sort of number, which is very small for delta X, I find delta PX is about 10 to the minus 28 kilogram meter sec minus 1. Well, what does that number tell us? Well, you can check this for yourself, but what it means for a billiard ball is that we'd have to wait a million, million years before it moved about a millionth of a millimeter. Not much of a movement. In fact, in everyday language, it's perfectly stationary. Once again, then, the ideas of quantum theory are not contradicting the everyday world. It's just that the effects are so small that we're never going to observe them. Let's see if I can pot the brown. Well, no trouble with the uncertainty principle there. But things are very different when we look at electrons. According to Bohr's model, the electron in a hydrogen atom moves in a circular orbit around the nucleus. And we should be able to measure simultaneously the position and momentum of the electron to any accuracy we like. But the problem is that this flatly contradicts the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So this model must be wrong. The correct model of the hydrogen atom is based on Schrödinger's equation, which allows us to predict the probability that we'll detect the electron in different regions of the atom. Now, in this particular picture, we can see the probability density when the electron has its lowest possible energy, when it's in its ground state. We really can't specify the motion of the electron around the nucleus, and we just have to live with the uncertainties of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics applies across the entire distance speed diagram. But because the value of Planck's constant is so tiny, we normally observe quantum effects only in this region. And in exactly the same way, the special theory of relativity applies across the entire diagram. But because the speed of light is so large, we normally observe relativistic effects only at very high speeds. Well, the quantum effects we've been looking at in this program can all be understood using the Schrodinger equation, which applies equally well to free particles like the electrons in a diffraction experiment and to confined particles like the electron in a hydrogen atom. But there's a problem with Schrodinger's equation. In atomic physics, we often have to deal with particles that are moving at very high speeds. But Schrodinger's equation is not a relativistic equation. It's not consistent with the principle of relativity. What we really need is a relativistic theory of quantum mechanics. And that's one of the main subjects of the next unit. But I hope this program has given you some insights into some of the basic ideas of quantum theory and has shown you that classical concepts don't carry down to the world of the atom. The golden rule, remember, is beware of preconceived ideas. They can often lead you astray. So, keep an open mind when interpreting what you see, or what you think you see. Well, that's the end of programs for Open University for tonight. Don't forget that there's a full morning of programs from various courses on both Saturday and Sunday on BBC One and also on BBC Two. But from all of us here on BBC Two for now, good night.
frost anywhere from the North Midlands northwards, so a bit more of that at a later date. Let's take a look at Sunday then, that low well and truly with us, but eventually brighter showery weather getting into Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northern England and North Wales, the south staying rather cloudy with some more rain. Europe for the weekend, that cool showery weather working its way down to the Alps where there could be some snow flurries. There's the rain into southwestern parts of the British Isles, unsettled on the eastern side of Europe, once again the sunshine in the Mediterranean. And now a look at the highlights in this weekend's lineup of Open University programmes. Explore some of the programmes from the Open University this Saturday and Sunday. There's something for everyone, whether your interests lie in new opportunities for America's black children, understanding mental illness, finding out how social scientists work, or catching up with the latest Open Forum programme. So first, a look at that programme about America's poor black children and a project started in the 60s called Head Start. The most successful component of the programme is, is the development of good self-image um, and a realisation that there are very few things in life that one cannot conquer, even if you're four years old. Uh, that there are things in life that can be controlled by you in your environment, even if you're 35 years old and are a parent. Uh, when, when you are a parent on AFDC, receiving assistance from the state, or when you're unemployed and have never had an opportunity to work, it is difficult sometimes to believe that you have any control over your destiny. Head Start helps the parent understand that not only do they have control over themselves, but they also have control as it relates to the environment in which their child exists. So Head Start is just that. It's a Head Start, and we think a super Head Start. Head Start. Children of the Dream at 9.35 on Saturday morning. Later on Saturday, a programme about a little-known mental disorder. Not many people have heard of Tourette's Syndrome. It's a complex and intriguing disorder that combines distinct physical symptoms with unusual mental behaviours. <laughs> to clinicians, Tourette's is an array of symptoms in search of a cure. To scientists, a puzzle that still defies explanation. But to those who live with Tourette's, it's a lifelong companion that often makes its entrance quite unexpectedly. A program from an Open University biology course demystifies this rare mental illness. That's at 1.45 on Saturday afternoon. Now on to Sunday, and a program from one of the Open University's most popular courses in social science. This one looks at why the work done by social scientists is so valuable. Gallup now publishes its poll results in the Daily Telegraph, as it has done since 1961. And it's for its political opinion polls that Gallup has become well known. If there were a general election tomorrow, which party would you support? Conservative. If there were a general election tomorrow, which party would you support? Labour. We are obviously known because of our voting surveys. It, it's an advantage and a disadvantage. It gives us the publicity, but it is a disadvantage that people think we do not do anything else and that therefore we are only uh, into opinion polls. In fact, the commercial side of our business is, or oh, 90% or more of our business. We, of course, do the, the top of the pops chart uh, for the BBC on what are the popular records, but we are out every day of the week asking people the the bread and butter questions about building societies and, and videos, cars, you name it, we've probably asked questions about it. Social scientists at work find out more about their contributions to the society we live in at 20 past 10 on Sunday morning. Just over 100. And if we've given you an appetite to find out more about the Open University, stay tuned for Open Forum. In the last of the current series, Howard Stableford takes a look back at some of the interesting stories the programme has covered this year. Now that includes joining Open University scientists tracking lava flows on Mount Etna. Now I'm rather interested to know just how dangerous it is working at the summit of a live volcano. Well, All that and much more with Howard Stableford in Open Forum at 10 past 11 on Sunday. 
just a few of the programmes from the Open University this weekend. There are full details in Radio Times and on CFAX, page 618.